of 1997. It's the final event in a wonderful month, a kind of adventure through the body of work of Peter Greenaway in our G is for Greenaway series. He's been here with us today, and I will shortly be bringing him on stage. Tonight really is a night of Peter's. We not only have Mr. Greenaway, but his interlocutor tonight, Peter Wolin. And then finally, a Peter you won't see, who I want to acknowledge at the beginning, Peter Murphy, who for a better part of a decade has been masterminding these evenings that so elegantly run with excerpts from the films being able to be in interpolated into the dialogue. So my thanks to Peter Murphy, who will be the invisible Peter tonight. <laughs> Just a couple of words of introduction. Peter Wohl and I first met as a graduate student about 20 years ago. He has continued to teach for the last eight years at UCLA. He is the author of what at one time was the leading book on film theory, Signs and Meaning in the Cinema, but he's also continued to publish and write, regular contributor to the British journal Sight and Sound. He has lectured widely. He has continued to uh, do a great deal of things, including uh, screenplay writing. You may know him a little bit from uh, the screenplay he did for Antonioni's The Passenger, as well his last visit here to The Walker with a wonderful allegorical film, Friendship's Death. He's going to need those skills tonight as he's matched against probably the most iconoclastic figure in contemporary cinema, someone whose writings about film and whose work in film, which now numbers 74 films. It's an amazing career in 30 years. But not just cinema. He's been involved in opera. He's a painter. He's got commissions now for new exhibitions in Japan. He'll be, I gather, in a year or so doing a reinstallation of the Brooklyn Museum's permanent collection. He's really a, quite a Renaissance man. Tonight, to talk about an extraordinary body of work, to give you a little bit of a sense of a new film that will be released in June, The Pillar Book, and really reflect on three decades of trying to reinvent this medium that last year turned 100. It gives me a great deal of pleasure to welcome Peter Greenaway and Peter Wallen. I get to ask the questions. Um, we haven't rehearsed this um, <laughs> uh, in any way. This is spontaneous. Um, but I'm going to begin by asking, I, I did warn him about actually, to be honest, about what I was going to say, ask at the beginning, which was to talk a bit about childhood, which seems, which as I said, I could validate by pointing out how important childhood is in your films, but actually I'm just really interested in, you know, like, what did your parents do, and especially what child, child, children's books you, you remember? Well, I suppose the most significant parts of my childhood that I would still make public and probably <laughs> use as a raw material, uh, certainly initially, although maybe I've glorified this a bit, my father was a very, very keen, you can't call it ecology way back in the 1930s and 1940s, you'd probably have to call it natural history. <coughs> so my father's great passion was birds, ornithology, flying. He wasn't a particularly educated man, but he did have a great sense of observation. He did also have an extremely large uh, library of natural history books. I think that's basically all he had. So there'd be very, very works of fiction in my father's library. Um, the possibilities, I suppose, of making a professional living as a natural historian, or indeed as an ornithologist, uh, are quite difficult now. Although, of course, there are many, many opportunities with television, et cetera, et cetera, to become, to rework yourself as a David Attenborough. <laughs> 
but those sorts of um, opportunities certainly didn't exist then. So my father had this great frustration that certainly he had to pay the bills and look after me and my brother and family, etc. So he was a businessman in the city of London and on every single opportunity he could possibly find, he used to drag us screaming and kicking up to the marshes of East Anglia. And for any of you who've seen the film Drowning by Numbers, it's that particular sort of landscape which I certainly try to evoke in that film and also all the associations that I remember. And children's books. I'm, I'm actually interested in Kate Greenaway and A, a is for Apple, B bit it, C cooked it. Well, my, my father, I think, saw some peculiar form of cultural snobbism, which perhaps he, even he, didn't quite understand. Certainly tried very hard to pretend that we were associated with Kate Greenaway, but it was <laughs> extremely difficult to prove genealogically. My family, I suppose, is split. One part of the Greenaways come from Essex, and uh, Mrs. Thatcher's favorite part of the world, and the other come from Somerset. And Kate Greenaway herself did, in fact, come from Somerset, and we did indeed have ancestors in the same cities. But it's very, very difficult, you know, to swear on the Bible that, in fact, there is a blood relationship. And what did you read? I mean, what do you look back on now, think, in childhood? Is this a This one? Yes, quite a bit closer. Quite a bit. <coughs> okay. Okay, is that better? Thank you. Okay, sorry. Um, what, do, what do you remember with, with pleasure from your childhood reading? Um, I suppose the, again, I'm going to slightly um, twist your okay, questions fine. in order to service my imagination. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the particular, again, uh, Drowning by Numbers really is a key to this because that particular film is very much about childhood memories and it is full of references to English illustrators, not just Kate Greenaway of course, but um, the, we have I suppose a very, very um, bourgeois tradition of the character of Rupert Bear. Bestel. Indeed. I mean there were many, uh, all, many writers and illustrators but he's the most famous. and. Uh, I suppose for about 30 or 40 years, I n this uh, character was syndicated in the Daily Express, yeah. which was the f a, a rather sort of uh, middle-brow paper in which my father took. But the, the great uh, excitement, I suppose, every Christmas was to open yet another annual of yeah. the Rupert Bear. I got this. And, okay, it was a cosy, comfortable world, and everything ultimately turned out all right. But the actual picturing of an idyllic English landscape with the church in the right place and the fields operating as they should do and the notion of lots of the typically country rustic activities, I think um, fitted very much into early ideas of my imaginations about the country. I mean, I was essential, though I was born in Wales, most of my early education was uh, associated with suburban London. So the escape to the country was, was a bit of an urban dream, but it was, I suppose, um, in some way focused by this particular um, story of a, a small bear child who had all these extraordinary adventures in the country. What about the Chinese magician? Well, my favorite character, and I want to bring her up in the next film, you see how I'm twisting your <laughs> answers, was a character called Tiger Lily. Uh, that his daughter, indeed, right? but I mean, it was she, I suppose, the, the sort of uh, proto-potential sexual relationship between the bear child and tiger lily always fascinated me. <laughs> and then you went to school, right? Mm. And that was hell on earth or delightful? No, I, I went to one of those typical English public schools, sort of uh, sadomasochism, um, <laughs> sort of various forms of both spoken and unspoken homosexuality, fagging, violence, uh, bullying, etc., etc. One of those places that I'm sure that the Duke of Edinburgh sent his son, and we know what happened to him. <laughs> but I certainly didn't like it. Uh, it was too authoritarian, too rigid, too uh, straightjacketed. And um, I was uh, deeply unhappy and very unpopular. And did you, <laughs> what did you take refuge in? Well, I, I suppose, again, like um, 
okay, we say so many bad things about the English uh, public school system. But they were deeply interested in the humanities, so I learned uh, Latin and Greek, and of course had a very um, deep investigation, certainly into English literature. So we're moving away now, of course, from childhood literature to a very, very thorough grounding in everything that's represented by the notion of English letters. And then why did you go to art school rather than university? Well, my father, again, I suppose, being a businessman, hoping that his son would be able to find a sensible way of living with a decent uh, relationship with his bank accountant, insisted, of course, that, or laid down certain parameters that indeed I should go to university. Um, I certainly um, got a place, uh, but I rejected it. I was determined that that's not what I wanted to do. I had been encouraged by a whole series of people that I had some sort of talent that I could uh, capitalize on as being a draftsman or a painter. And though my attitude towards those particular subjects, I suspect, was deeply impractical, I decided what I wanted to do was to go to art school. So I broke with my family, moved to the other part of London, and indeed went to art school. And what, what was that like? That was a relief. It was an extraordinary renaissance. Uh, here I was moving away from a single sex school to a school where there were women. Um, there was the opportunity to fulfill all the excitements that I'd anticipated in terms of um, drawing from the nude figure. Uh, from enormous amounts of um, moving away from the straight lace situation, again, of, a, of an English um, public school education. So it was an enormous relief. I can remember now how excited I was by that sense of relief on the very, very first day that I went there. And did it include art history or was it...? Yes, it, um, I suppose by contemporary standards, it was very much based upon uh, post-impressionism, all the lecturers tended to come from uh, an enjoyment of a late Parisian sort of uh, Vuillard Bonnard background. And the favored English painter at that particular time was Sickert. And so we used to walk the corridors in derision of our tutors chanting, sick, 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 sick. <laughs> I'm, this is at Walthamstow, but did you go on to the Slade or something? I don't know. No, I didn't. When I finished the four years, I was determined then. I had had this sort of road to Damascus experience that not only was I interested in still images, but I was also interested in moving images. One particular afternoon, um, before, in fact, I got to art school, the public school I went to was very, very keen on cricket. And the fat boy in the class, a, ma uh, a boy I hardly ever knew, suggested, because cricket has been rained off on this particular afternoon, suggested we should go to the local soft pornographic flea pit and uh, see what was on offer. And in those days, and we're talking about the late 1950s, early 1960s, anything Swedish was softly pornographic. <laughs> And the cinema manager, and certainly the fat boy, and certainly me, had no inclination whatsoever that this particular afternoon was showing a certain Swedish film by a certain director called Igmar Bergman, and that film was The Seventh Seal. <laughs> and it was an absolute revelation. I, of course, had been to the cinema many, many times, but treated it very much like a, a social activity, as most adolescents in some senses do. I'd seen, of course, hundreds and hundreds of American language, English language cinema, but I suppose this was the first foreign language movie I'd ever seen, and it seemed to me to satisfy so many of the things that I was interested in. And I think a, a lot of people of my generation would turn to that particular film. I know Melvin Bragg, for example, regarded it as an important part of his background in industry. Well too, right? yeah, absolutely, I saw it when I was at university. It's a big deal. Um, but there's a leap between you know that kind of cinephilia and thinking this is wonderful and actually becoming a filmmaker i mean what were the steps that took you into into filmmaking as such I mean, for instance nowadays in art schools there's often filmmaking is taught but was, was that the case or did you have to do it by not yourself not at all yeah. it was because uh, again this happened about 6 months before in fact i did go to art school but as soon as I'd established myself and settled down and got used to the fact that there were women around and all those other things, it was um, suggested that we should form one of those typical English film clubs, of which there are so many, or you certainly used to be so many once upon a time. So I was responsible for organizing the program. 
And um, I suspect my education in that vein was extremely um, autodidactic. I never really sort of understood perspectives of what was what. So I managed to get all sorts of probably incredible bad movies simply because not knowing the parameters. But I remember, I think, three, hour, three evenings of every single week in term time, we rolled out the projector and we showed uh, extraordinary, what to me were extraordinary foreign films. And I began at that particular time to um, really feel that somewhere in my life, at some stage, again, totally impractically, I wanted to be associated with the notions of cinema. So how did you set about it? Well, when I left art school, um, I had uh, various quite successful um, painting exhibitions. Um, I realized that somehow there was still a gap. I wasn't really satisfying what I really wanted to do. And I thought it would be very, very important for me to see if I could make my ambitions in some senses practical. And I knew that certainly my paintings indicated in my background that I was interested in collating, collecting, organizing. Um, and it seemed to be very imperative to me that I should try and make myself, turn myself if possible, into a film editor. That happened by very, very slow degrees. I started very, very humbly in cutting rooms, cutting documentaries for BBC Thames Television, and ultimately I fetched up at a place which I know always causes a smile to flicker across people's faces. It was an institution called the Central Office of Information. <laughs> it sounds very, very Politburo. It was, in fact, an extension of the English Crown Film Unit had been responsible for so much documentary activity during the war years. It didn't quite know what it ought to do in peacetime. But we still, I suppose, were in the throes of losing the colonies. The colonies were becoming the Commonwealth. And the British Home Office were very keen to keep contact with all these countries, especially in India, especially in Australasia, especially in Africa and they aided and abetted the setting up of individual television distribution situations by providing from London huge amounts of documentary material, uh, magazine programs and documentaries about the British way of life. So how did you, but then at some point you must have started to make films for yourself rather than for the COI. Um, because the salary was good, because it was regular, because I had access to editing equipment, there was a way indeed, I suppose, even from the first uh, week of my establishment in the COI, I was able to um, afford small sums of money to find and buy stock and buy cameras, and indeed parallel with my professional activity as it were at the COI, I began to make very modest black and white clockwork Bolex movies. Those were the days six, of 16 mil 16. Bolex uh, black and white film. And what I mean, when you were doing that, what did you think you were doing? I mean, who was, in your mind, who was going to see them and how, how did you set about getting the... the well, I suspected my, my audience then would probably be my assistant film editor, my brother and his dog. Yeah. <laughs> uh, very, very small audiences, of course. I had no idea, I had no conception of who the audience would be. Um, I had had a lot of association with the BFI I had um, performed various temporary jobs with them in the distribution department. I was certainly very much aware of the very large BFI 60 mil archives, and that way I would be interested, I suppose, to many, many years of what could be described, I suppose, as underground filmmaking. Yes. I was certainly aware of uh, American underground filmmaking in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, and 60s. And that was a particularly good example to me because they could demonstrate that you could make very, very interesting films indeed on very, very slim resources. Okay, now we've got to the BFI, maybe we can move on to a clip from a film you did for the BFI, which is The Falls, but I just wanted to ask one more question before we did this, which I forgot to ask earlier. Did you collect things as a child? Yes, and that has never left me. I am a great, great hoarder. Um, going back, for those of you who might have seen Drowning by Numbers, there is a small child in it who has the name of Smut. And he certainly collects many, many things. He certainly collects dead bodies. He collects his corpses, and he certainly is, I suppose, a sort of amateur entomologist. That, in some ways, I suppose, would relate to my father's discipline, 
because there was no way on earth I was going to be particularly interested directly in what my father was interested in, but you can understand the relationship of insects to birds. So as whereas he studied the birds, I studied what they ate. Okay, let's watch the clip from the, f clip from the falls, which does indeed have bird reference in it. <laughs> okay, I think probably the time has come to ask you to tell me about Tulsa Looper. Well, I'm sure we're all familiar with the notion of being very small and inventing a friend. Somebody who could be made responsible for all domestic accidents. The person who sat apparently on the empty chair beside you at breakfast who was responsible for spilling the milk. And I suppose, though certainly I didn't call him Tulsa Looper, that would be the origins. But I I suppose during the period when I was making all these films at the COI, I was very painfully maybe putting together a sort of picture of what knowledge and filmmaking would be and how it would be particularly valuable to put it into a position so I could use it. And I was discovering all sorts of people who had a great influence, not only in terms of my education professionally, but also my own personal investigation. And there were a whole series of people like Buckminster Fuller, uh, Marcel Duchamp, certainly John Cage. Um, I suspect also a bit later people who'd had a great literary influence on me, people like Borges, maybe even later still the cameraman that I habitually use, Sasha Vierney. Maybe also my father was probably be in there, and who knows, maybe, uh, maybe the uh, Chinese magician out of Rupert Bear that you mentioned. So it was an opportunity to construct a semi-fictional character with characteristics of all these people. And also at that particular time, I was far too nervous and shy to ever suggest that Peter Greenaway was responsible for anything. So I invented this sort of alter ego, which I suppose was an amalgam of all the things that I wished in some senses that I represented. Uh, this character, Tulsa Looper, first appeared in a film called A Walk Through H which actually predates the falls that you see on the screen here. And very rapidly, he created academic, academic enemies. He had various sexual relations with certain people. Perhaps the most celebrated for me would be with somebody called Sissy Colpitz, who then turned up times three in a later movie called Drowning by Numbers. She's in the falls, too. Indeed, she is. And there was also a character called Van Hoyten. There was a man called Lafrenic. And I suppose I played lots of games with these people, both in an obvious way and maybe in a slightly indirect way, because the character of Van Hoyten did in fact turn up as a Dutchman in the Drassen's contract, and did make an appearance indeed in Zenden Orts as the keeper of the owls of the Amsterdam Zoo. There is a way, of course, subsequent filmmaking pushed this mythology back and back and back. But I'm so delighted you asked me this question, because the next film we're going to make is called The Tulse Looper Suitcase. And it is a huge attempt for me to go back to that certainly private mythology, but I hope it has a lot of public connotations as well, and virtually to make a film which is the history of this fictitious character. Great. I'm really looking forward to it. <laughs> and, um, the, the other question I wanted to ask was just a little bit more about the, the whole kind of experimental film world, because in a way, you began within that world. Most of those films from this period, culminating in a way with, with, the, with the falls, would be seen as experimental films. But did, what kind of connections did you have with organizations like the co-op, or what knowledge did you have of filmmakers like Michael Snow or, or Hollis Frampton and so on? Sure. Well, those names, of course, I had come across in terms of the, um, the British Film Institute Library. Um, my great hero from that particular period would be Hollis Frampton. And I certainly tried very, very hard to see absolutely everything he'd ever done. Um, there was a way a little later, uh, when I had established myself just a little more, that indeed I did pay a pilgrimage to Buffalo to see, in fact, if I could meet my hero. But unfortunately, I arrived in Buffalo about uh, four or five 
uh, weeks before, sadly, uh, Hollis uh, died of cancer. Um, there, I suppose, were three influences. First of all, there was very much the documentary tradition, which was very much present at the COI, because, after all, their legacy had been picked up after the whole Grissom phenomenon of the notion of the British documentary. The second, indeed, was the one that I just mentioned, uh, a somewhat uninformed but very excited brush with all these very, very interesting, uh, essentially American, but also North, North European underground filmmakers. And third, of course, was the basic uh, um, European art cinema, which was available in many, many cinemas in London in the early 1960s. And I think we all, a lot of us, would look back to that period that there were a great many very fascinating European uh, film directors who were doing a lot of extraordinary work. Um, I'm certainly uh, old enough to have seen most of the Nouvelle Vague films as they came out. My enthusiasms for early Truffaut, for example, which I have to admit never extended much beyond Jules de Gym, but certainly those first three extraordinary movies, I made every effort to make the pilgrimage again, not coming west, but indeed going east, and trying to find them before they ever came in London, so I would make um, trips to Paris to go and catch them very, very early. And I thought, certainly at this particular time, that my cinema would be somewhere posited between Hollis Frampton and Alain René. Um, I don't know whether the circumstances of Hollis's films are particularly well known now. Uh, he was a bit of a recherche taste even then, I think. Mm. I'm sure that you knew all about him, yeah, and there was a, a major influence on me too. A coterie of people <laughs> in England who were deeply fascinated by him. But there was a certain sort of apocrypha about the gentleman yeah. too, because there was a way one always imagined his films perhaps far more easily than it was possible often to actually see them. That's very true. And which René films? Well, I suppose it was the great trilogy. You know, I, uh, I have a feeling that we can all play this game. Uh, I, I feel certain there's a way in which all filmmakers are allowed three extraordinary films. Sometimes they're bunched very conveniently together, or, or sometimes, of course, you'd have to have a whole lifetime, and there would be a way in which these films could be selected, maybe out of an oeuvre based upon 40 or 50 years. But for me, René's three great films all came together, Hiroshima Mon Amour, Last Year in Marienbad, and Muriel. And I, I read somewhere that when you came to make the draftsman's contract, you screened films for the casting. Which, which ones were they? If I can remember accurately, there was uh, Romer's first rather surprising film, which is rather different from all his subsequent films, which the Marquise de, uh, Marquise de Do, I think it was called. No, that wasn't the first that wasn't one. one? Was later. Lion in the Streets, maybe the first one. Well, the first one was that extraordinary um, uh, fable about the woman who becomes pregnant and doesn't know who the father is. Right. You know that film? No, we don't share that same vocabulary. No. Um, okay, another one was, yeah. was certainly Fellini's, um, Fellini's film about the Italian lover. Um, who's that? We should all know who that is. You see how misty this becomes now. I know, exactly. <laughs> um, you, you need not answer anymore. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Last year in Marienbad certainly was on the list. Um, Beata Lucci's Last Tango in Paris, I think, was on the list. And I think there were two more. The idea was, I suppose, because I'd never certainly ventured into making a feature film ever before, although I suppose already on my filmography there must have been about 14 or 15 short films, I thought that by showing my cast and crew what I thought the draftsman's contract should somehow be about, that we indeed did sit all our um, actors, certainly, and one or two members of our crew in front of these particular films. Uh, even now, subsequently, what these people thought of these um, uh, uh, collection of often uh, unrelated material is very, very difficult to say. I rather suspect that most of them fell asleep or left the cinema. And what, what induced you to switch from these kind of hybrids of documentary and structural experimental film to narrative dramatic film with well, Spirits, costumes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure that, Peter, both you and I know, because we were both associated in perhaps different sorts of ways with the British Film Institute at that time, there was um, uh, 
for me, certainly very enlightened gentleman, a man called Peter Sainsbury, who ran the British Film Experimental uh, Fund. And he, he finally suggested, because he'd found the wherewithal to support me, to fund me for about three BFI movies, comparatively short, uh, small sums of money, like this one you've just seen a quote from, The Falls. And he suggested that um, I should maybe eschew my notions of uh, deliberately uh, perverting or subverting the ideas of the documentary, and I should make a film where people, instead of talking to you, the audience, should talk to one another. <laughs> and the result of that was uh, the script of the draftsman's contract. Okay, let's watch the next clip, which is from the draftsman's contract. <laughs> I'm afraid so, yes. With a, with a perspective grid? Or? Yes, indeed. It, uh, it was perhaps one of the most painful things to do for the whole of the film. How long did it, I mean, it's just curiosity, but how long did it take? To a long, long time indeed. The notion of the film revolves around the idea that one should, or an artist should, certainly in the context of the terms and the aesthetics of the film, to draw what one sees and not one knows what one knows. And that's quite a difficult proposition to pursue. We did initially employ an architect draftsman, a gentleman now with a very large reputation at the Architectural Association, uh, to in fact um, make the drawings. But I'm afraid he tended to draw what he knew rather than what he could see. So, since that rather spoilt the veracity of the plot, I felt that um, I was obliged to do the drawings myself. And, I mean, I, again, th this, do you start, I mean, the words which are there, which you've just sort of re-quoted about seeing and knowing and intelligence and painting, are those kind of your ventriloquistic words, or are they dramatic fiction? No, I think they are related to my particular anxieties and disquiet about what I thought that I was trying to do. I was always described at art school as being far too literary, which maybe is the English painterly disease. We remember famously how um, Francois Truffaut suggested that English cinema is a contradictory term. <laughs> it perhaps could be said that English painting is a contradictory term. I suppose the only true painters, maybe, who had an entirely imagistic as opposed to literary vision, the only three painters perhaps we can offer the international painting establishment probably would be maybe Constable Turner and possibly Francis Bacon. There are indeed many, 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 many English painters, and certainly I try to quote a lot of them in Drowning by Numbers. But um, our abilities, I suppose, very self-evidently are more to do with um, the production of um, a literary view of the world than they are particularly of a painterly view. And I suppose that I too had been, I suppose for all sorts of reasons of cultural baggage and background, etc., was um, certainly accused at art school indeed of making my paintings far too literary. So some of the criticisms, I suppose, that certainly my tutors made towards me are invested in that particular dialogue. I do think there's another situation, too, that I tended to admire those people who certainly would have um, an intellectual approach to the business of the manufacture of imagery. And Western history, I think, in terms of cultural painting, is littered with characters like Vasari and Reynolds. To a certain extent, people like Della Francesca and Poussin who may be, certainly for me, and of course for the uh, general painterly establishment, in some senses are very important people, but they perhaps do not really grab the human, image, uh, human central excitement and the emotional uh, association that may be the, the even greater painters that have been uh, responsible for the manufacture of images in the Western world. So I'm sure that certainly um, Rembrandt, for example, has a greater ability to pull in terms of the manufacture of imagery than should we say somebody indeed like Poussin. And I suppose that particular dilemma I felt in some ways would always be associated with me. So the dialogue, the little conversational piece that you've just seen on the film would be my, I suppose, um, my contemplation of that particular situation. And it's Duchamp too, I guess. 
He said Certainly, very similar indeed, to that. in the 20th century, yeah. yes, absolutely. And what led you, I mean, confronted with the idea of narrative, what led you to this sort of hybrid of the detect, English detective story, the country house murder story, with the restoration comedy? I mean, how did that come about? Well, I do, again, I suppose because of my um, uh, background, which you so cleverly teased out of me at the beginnings of this little talk, um, I certainly would be interested in natural history and ecology, and that would mean an interest, I suppose, in the beginnings of English landscape gardening, which would have been happening about this time, 1694. I was interested in the way that the English landscape went through a big revolution from about this time right up to the middle of the next century. Um, I was certainly interested in the country house culture and how it created pockets of provincial but quite intense sort of civilizing qualities. I was deeply interested, and 1694 is a very important year for English history. It sees the beginnings of the Married Woman's Property Act, around which notions of female emancipation in some senses this film revolves. It's the year of the founding of the Bank of England, independence of the fiscal and the state apparatus. And it also sees the beginnings, I suppose, of the essentially big change from a Stuart Frenchified and probably Catholic domination of the ideas of the United Kingdom with a whole new beginnings of the following century with associations of German and Dutch influence. So all that particular history, which to some people might be extraordinary academic, was of great fascination to me. But I was also interested in fruit symbolism. I was interested in how Catholics and Protestants treated their servants differently in the way in which, I suppose, gardens as exteriors and the planning of English country houses as interiors was deeply related. And I could go on with this academic list. But what I wanted to do was to see if it was possible to make a multi-layered film, which would, in, I suppose, have an opportunity to contain all these particular ideas, but at heart, essentially, was one of those very familiar Agatha Christie country house detective dramas. So if you didn't want to know about color symbolism and you couldn't care less about the way that how Roman Catholics treated their servants, there was a way in which there were various ways into this movie. And the Whigs. And indeed the Whigs, yes. We, we piled them up and made them far taller than was ever historically ever possible. <laughs> you know, I've, I've got, in a way it's, the wigs actually leads me on to something else, which is to do with fashion. I mean, I detect th right through your films an interest in fashion. I know you made a film about Zandra Rhodes. Gautier is going to come up in The Cook and the Thief. There's a couturier in the pillow book. And where, where's all that coming from? <coughs> well, I've always been a sucker. Let's, let's, think of, um, let's think of Seven Seal. It's a historical drama. Yeah. I've always been fascinated by the notion that cinema can very, very successfully, apparently, take you into places where it's absolutely impossible to be in reality. And I suppose the whole genre of the history movie, the movie that moves you through historical time, has always been a great, great fascination. I, I will go a long distance, correction, I used to go a long distance to see any historical film, however bad or indifferent it was. I'm excited by that notion of being able to conjure up, to recreate, to manufacture, receive notions of a foreign period, an exotic universe. I like the fact that it's almost like examining notions of science fiction, so you can create parallel universes without in any way being particularly anecdotal about your present day existence. I suppose the Drassen's contract is about power politics. It's certainly about the gender war, and these phenomena, of course, can exist well outside the particular conditions of a historical drama set in 1694. I am interested how the world wants to treat itself, how it wants to be represented, how it's interesting in terms of fashion and stance and etiquette and local fashionable manners. I've always been interested in that particular, I suppose, ephemerality, if you wish, because it has so many markers about notions of representation again, how a particular community or an individual or a person or a society wants itself to be seen. And I notice by your raised eyebrows you don't think that's a very adequate answer. <laughs> 
Well, I, no, I thought it was a very full and comprehensive answer, but I, I, actually, I've, I've, the, it, the specific thing I was interested in was, you know, like, what led you to do a film? Was it on Zandra Rhodes, for instance? Well, I suppose that was something to do with paying the mortgage, I have to admit, initially. Um, a lot of the COI production was associated with ideas of um, the phenomenon that journalists call swinging London, the swinging 60s. Zandra Rhodes was a big sort of popular figure associated with um, you know, pop artists and the English cultural scene at that time. Uh, we were, in fact, like all television series, very interested not just in one-offs but series. And Zandra Rhodes, I think, was going to be the flagship pilot film to make a big discussion about uh, notions of London fashion at that time. But, I mean, I have to admit that that was a received commission yeah. rather than an idea that initially came from me personally. Because she has the same sort of exaggerated... You know, I was, you know, just curious if the things were connected. Mm. But... Um, I think we should move on towards the next clip. Uh, television I was going to ask about next. Um, I mean, one thing about your career is you've worked across a wide variety of media, media. So how did you come to be involved with television? Well, a lot of the products from the COI itself were often, as I suggested maybe a little earlier, often shown not in a cinema situation abroad, but on television channels. Uh, a lot of the product, I suppose, inevitably was slowly moving, certainly in the five or six years or more that I spent at the COI, from the notion of, of film into TV. Um, Channel 4 television uh, virtually was being set up about the same time, early 1980s, as indeed the Drassens contract was made. In fact, the BFI, I think, and certainly I, was extremely grateful that um, since the budget for the draftsman's contract was um, uh, getting larger and larger as we made the film, that Channel 4 Television, which had been set up, I think, 1981, 1982, actually came in and helped us finally finish the film. And it was with all those excited new commissioning editors who were, I suppose, enjoying um, the abilities for newfound freedoms in British television, and I was uh, repeatedly offered various opportunities to make films within British television, primarily, of course, Channel 4. Do you find it more, I mean, which do you find you, you get more independence in film or, or television? Well, I suppose in the area that I was working in, which didn't necessarily have to find a very intense equation with being commercially successful, there were certain sorts of freedoms, but that particular period in the early 1980s with Channel 4 Television, there did seem to be a great interest in a certain amount of risk-taking. And a lot of my commissions didn't come directly from the film department, but came from other departments. Like, for example, there was a commissioning editor for sport who suggested we should get together and make a celebratory film about the British synchronized swimming company who were about to come, I think, to the Los Angeles Games and come about 28th in the competition. But, <laughs> I mean, it's rather curious that maybe uh, eccentric English filmmakers should be commissioned by the Minister of Sport, so to speak. And then th there was a very good music department, too, in uh, Channel 4 at those times. And um, uh, we were very interested in making connections with a whole series of um, uh, music organizations in London. There was a very um, advanced and investigative theater called the Almeida. And it was their particular policy to invite certainly American composers to come to Europe and to play uh, uh, concerts there. And that was the excuse for me to be commissioned by Channel 4 Television to make a series which we called Four American Composers. One of my heroes, as I mentioned before, was certainly John Cage. And I certainly wanted to make a film about him. And they suggested again, like all television companies, let's have a series as opposed to one. And we ended up with making films about certainly John Cage, Meredith Monk, Robert Ashley, and Philip Glass. And who commissioned Dante's Inferno, which is the next clip? The so commissioning so editor um, of special documentary programs. Uh, again, extraordinary, uh, maybe rash opportunity. Uh, a gentleman called Michael Custo, and he was incredibly long-suffering. Uh, the budgets, again, for this production grew and grew and grew, and we spent, I say we because uh, 
there were two uh, co-directors. Um, there is an English painter called Tom Phillips, who probably is about uh, five or six years older than I am. He was responsible, I think, along with the American painter who settled in England, Ron Kitai, R.B. Kitai, for uh, allowing me or permitting me great legitimacy in my particular interest in painting. And um, we paired up rather, I suppose, um, like uh, two intellectuals playing with the gizmos, playing with the material, dabbling in the possibilities of a new language to make indeed, uh, or to start making it, because uh, it was never finished, an attempt to try and make a version of Dante's Inferno for television. Great, so let's watch a clip. This, who's, I mean, who's are the faces that are flipping past just, you know, just another very last All my time? friends and enemies and all the film critics that I ever knew. <laughs> really? It's consigned to hell? Well, why not? Yeah. Ideal place for them. <laughs> but you probably also recognize Bob Peck, who perished yes, miserably in Jurassic Park. Yeah, no, I did indeed. <laughs> I, was t I turned him down for a part and told him to tell his agent that it was because he was in Jurassic Park. And I got this message back saying, you know, I never thought anyone would refuse me a part because I'd been in Jurassic Park. Anyway, that's... that's well, I mean, I, I also have, I mean, okay, let's be very bitchy. Uh, <laughs> I asked Bob Peck to appear in The Cook, the Thief, His Wife and Her Lover, and he absolutely was livid that ever I should possibly consider him appearing in such a deeply amoral film. <laughs> okay. That's no, no wonder he went to Hollywood. To hell, one might say. European literature, a huge compendium, a massive encyclopedia. Maybe Dante was the last person, in a sense, that could represent everything that was in the world at any one given place. Certainly his place was northern Italy, written round about the year 1300. So there is a way that Dante's Inferno tells you about butchers, how to, how to tie a baby's nappy, how to go to heaven, how to make love in 74 stages, how to reach God. It's an extraordinary compendium of everything that existed in the world at that one time. And we very, very ambitiously hope to find a late 20th century equivalent for that. So, uh, I mean, this is when, when, when did CD-ROMs first appear? This is just a little too early for yeah. CD-ROMs, I think. So that still wasn't... That, it wasn't really discussed in any form. I mean, obviously, this would make ideal material. I mean, the next stage, I suppose, would be to continue these experiments, rework them, maybe we'd have to start all over again, and to make a presentation where the whole thing was so much more sympathetic to contemplation by an audience, so that you, know, you an audience, or indeed any audience, could examine all this multiplicity of material in a way where the audience had the time frame and it wasn't the responsibility of the director. And how long did it take? I must have again taken Well, each long. canto, and there are 38 cantos, I seem to remember. Uh, each canto took us about a month to make. We were making something like, um, I don't know, 30 seconds of film a day, which was incredibly expensive. But the notion was that neither Tom Phillips or I could possibly spend our entire lives illustrating Dante's Inferno. So the notion was that, Why not? <laughs> well, I mean, I have great problems myself, <laughs> retrospectively, about the notion of illustration, which I feel a great sense of disquiet and anxiety about anyway. But um, the idea was that if we wouldn't stay with it, it would be handed over to a whole series of people who maybe had the same intensity, not only about the subject matter, but also about the medium. And the following 10 cantos after we finished, were handed over to Raoul Rios, who produced an entirely different viewpoint. Uh, Brian Eno was going to do 10. Um, there were various other people who uh, uh, suggested should become involved. Um, unfortunately, I think in the end, Channel 4 got thoroughly, um, how should we say, uh, frustrated by our particular machinations and interest. And Although the, the whole series has not exactly been dropped, it's certainly been put very much into the, uh, into the cupboard for the moment. And meanwhile, your f the filmmaking side of your career kind of left England at that point. Could you 
How did that happen? Well, the intimations of that probably started much earlier because after I'd shown the Draftsman's contract at the Rotterdam Film Festival, a very young Dutch producer, a man called Kees Cassander, came up to me with the most extraordinary proposition. He said that he and I should clear the decks of everything else that I was involved in and settle down to make three pictures in three years. An extraordinary opportunity for somebody who was very much still at the beginnings of trying to understand what his interest was in cinema. Uh, I certainly didn't want to put all my eggs in one Dutch basket, but um, we indeed made one film together, which was Z and Two Noughts. I then went away and worked with other producers, but then um, Mr. Case Cassander came back again after we had finished making The Belly of an Architect and um, offered his, um, his extraordinary offer all over again. And basically, um, Case Cassandra and I have continued to work in tandem ever since. And wh where was he coming from? He was the sort of understudy for the man called Hubert Bolse that used to run the Rotterdam Film Festival, which I don't know what you thought about it either then or now, but I thought was one of the most exciting film festivals in Europe. Certainly catered for all sorts of uh, alternative filmmaking activity and was responsible for, I suppose, quote unquote, discovering so many independent filmmakers. I mean, what do you, this is an aside, but what do you feel about festivals in general? I mean, I, I have a friend uh, called Arthur Omar who gave me a long lecture about how a new genre of film had appeared called the festival genre, which had its own rules and codes and which festival audiences and juries recognized just as you would recognize a Western or a gangster movie. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure the parameters of his description are absolutely accurate. I'm sure both you and I know, certainly throughout the 80s and 90s, they were often young filmmakers who made one film mm. and then spent their entire lives going from festival to festival with it tucked under their arm. They never ever touched a base again. They never came back. They never made a second film either. And um, you came back to England for The Cook and The Thief, which is going to lead us into the next clip. I mean, what brought, was that a decision on your part? You wanted to come back to England or was it by happenstance that that? Well, thanks to this Dutch producer, there was a way I was introduced to a very European um, collection, I suppose, not just simply uh, the crew, but everybody else who was responsible for the manufacture and distribution of a film. So that basically um, our setup was bound very much around my major collaborator, who would be Sacha Vierney, French cinematographer. He, he shot Marion Bird. And also Belle de Jour, and also apparently, although he's very, very reluctant to admit it, was in fact a minor part of the camera team way back on Cocteau's or Faye. So he has really? an extremely wow. long... Uh, it's hell again, um, hell again. Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> but um, our, our de design department was Dutch. Um, most of our uh, grips and rigging crew were Belgian. We certainly um, had a lot of uh, Dutch and uh, French associates, so we, we felt ourselves to be, I suppose, certainly not particularly English, but very, very European. I have to say very, very quickly, at that particular time, it was much, much cheaper to make a movie in Holland than it was in England. And Cook was, was shot in a studio? It was. It was shot at Elstree in London. Uh, again, we needed, for those huge, big open spaces, to have a very, very large studio indeed. Studios like that did not exist uh, in Holland. Uh, subsequently, uh, we made Prospero's books in a deserted um, oil tanker uh, building uh, establishment on the, Ro on the Rotterdam docks. But at that particular time, um, we would certainly needed a studio which would uh, be suitable for all the English actors we were using because we didn't want to spend huge sums of money on transporting actors around the world. And I think also there was one or two attractive uh, tax incentives. So we came back to England and indeed made the cook the thief his wife and her lover in England. Okay, this next clip. These are the Thatcher years. <laughs> that anything to do with this? Sort of. 
An English critic once said that um, the draftsman's contract was strangely a film to begin the Thatcher years, and the cook, the thief, his wife, and her lover was strangely a film to end them. <laughs> but I still think we have it's tomorrow, I think, isn't it? May the 1st, it's the English elections. May Day. Still, even until tomorrow, Mrs. Thatcher's influence remains, and let's just hope tomorrow that will all finally change. Um, what led you to the restaurant setting? Well, I was interested, I suppose, in, in the notion of extreme cannibalism when there is uh, nothing left to eat in the world, we will end up eating one another. The film, uh, again, I suppose, and I've noticed with the manufacture of the pillar book, has a very, very similar sort of strategy. It discusses the metaphor, and then, I suppose, as a warning, uh, we should uh, discuss metaphor with a great sense of responsibility because it might often have um, or create the circumstances where the metaphor becomes reality. And I suppose that really is basically the strategy of this movie. Uh, halfway through, two-thirds of the way through, discussion of ideas about uh, cannibalism have um, the inevitable outcome of becoming real. And I suppose the circumstances, again, under a different set of ideas is the way in which the pillar book has been organized. There's one moment for me which is most significant in the film is when Albert Speaker picks up a book and says, does this book make money? Which seemed to be, for me, exactly what was happening in Great Britain and no doubt maybe all over the Western world in terms of personal greed and gratification, extreme forms of vulgarity and excessive forms of philistinism, which I think was certainly part of the situation in terms of British culture and ideas through the latter part of the 1980s. But the, in your interest in the food chain goes way back before that. I mean, wh where does that come from? It's in a lot of your films, you know, this thing about the well, yeah, food chain. Well, there are lots of comparisons to be made, and of course this goes way, way back in terms of Western culture about sex and food, about copulation and digestion, about the anatomical parts, which we basically use the same channels to do both functions. So there's a way there are many, many metaphors that can be interchanged. There is a way also that I've always been fascinated simply in pictorial terms about the notion of the table, all the way from the last supper and all its ramifications right down to a simple humble painting like Van Gogh's The Potato Eaters. The notion of the table representing community, opportunity for people to be seen together, uh, to display manners, to display their wealth and their social function. It is also, I suppose, at heart very, very interesting that of all the paintings in Western culture that we can think of about tables, very few painters actually depict the sheer act of eating. Occasionally, in great paintings like maybe Veronese's marriage at uh, Cana, you will see one or two people picking their teeth and maybe one or two ladies drinking. But the actual approach of food to the mouth is not only quite difficult to paint, but it also rather spoils the notion of portraiture. So there's a nice sort of irony there. In fact, if you examine all the many, many uh, feastings and table paintings and table scenes, in a lot of my movies, you will see it's more like a tableau vivant about the notion of eating and drinking rather than the notion actually of digestion and mastication. Yeah, I mean, actually to support that, I worked for a time for a left-wing political photo magazine called Seven Days, I don't know whether you ever saw it, which Alexander Coburn was the photo editor. And he always gave instructions to anyone going out to photograph, say, a Tory MP, to photograph them when eating. <laughs> the, the, the photographers were sent fanned out around the land to photograph villains eating. It's the same, basically the same idea. But, I mean, what the, the, just to get back to the food chain for a minute, the food chain is always presented as kind of by nature hierarchical. You know, that X eats Y, which eats... I mean, do you, do you sort of accept the idea that nature has that basic, this is a philosophical question, so I'm sorry, but you know, here we go. Um, do you accept the idea that nature has a hierarchy like that built into it? Or is it something which you know, could be changed or which you would want to see changed or you know, what's... No, I would, I, would, I would certainly agree with that premise. Uh, 
um, the 1980s in England also saw the great sense of um, social habitat, sort of notions of nouvelle cuisine, the way that certainly in England uh, we don't really have a cuisine. We have some of the best restaurants in the world, but it's not our particular food. And the whole notion of eating out and being seen to eat out, it was very much again part of that yuppie culture. Because basically English prefer to eat at home. It always reminds me, is it that Borghesian story about reversing the idea that whereas in the world we are prepared to eat in public but defecate in private, what about the reversal of that and see what would happen? <laughs> The other thing I wanted to ask about, well, two other things, um, is about singing begins to be important in this film. And you've obviously got this interest which seems to grow over time in opera. And I wondered if you could say anything about that aspect of your interest. Well, do we really believe ever in the notion of silent cinema? Was there ever such a thing called silent cinema? Even those very, very early Lumiere films you know, had some sort of musical accompaniment. And I've always been fascinated by the way in which we can organize the excitements of the cinematic experience in terms of music and image. And I suppose there are very many examples, certainly in the movies that I've made, about trying to make those sorts of connections. A long-standing relationship with the uh, English composer Michael Nyman, for example. We must have made mm, 30, 35 films together, not just feature films. We'd always argued that composers and music, for the most part, had been very badly treated, largely, by the cinematic establishment, because there was always a way in which the image necessarily had to come first, and the music was always an adjunct to uh, decoration for mood and extra excitement after most of the strategies had been already organized. Uh, Michael Nyman and I certainly used to use, I suppose, some people say now, apocryphal relationship that Prokofiev had with Eisenstein in a film like Alexander Nevsky, so that we would organize our strategies in terms of music and image uh, a long time before one single note was recorded in a recording studio, and certainly before one single frame was turned into camera. I think the subsequent relationship, certainly that we had, was never ever as good after the draftsman's contract, because you probably remember, certainly the BFI was never necessarily in a hurry to get the film finished. There was a lot of time to deliberate. Um, but I think that that general premise would be always very important for us, to see if it was possible to find the ideal balance so that music didn't have a secondary or tertiary relationship to the image, but was intrinsically related to it. I became more and more fascinated by that. I also, I suppose, had a lot of doubts about the idea of what could be described as dead music in the cinema. So the excitements of live music would uh, constantly want me to see if these sorts of ideas that I was using in the cinema could also be used on an opera stage. And I think that's very much been part and parcel of why I've been interested, certainly latterly, in the whole business of making operas. But the last reel of the Cook and Thief, His Wife and Her Lover is, as I see it, very, very operatic indeed. People don't sing but they do practically everything else, which is a condition, I suppose, of 19th century grand opera. And opera, what about 20th century? I mean, is your interest in opera basically in 19th century grand opera or in 20th century opera? Well, again, a little schizophrenically, I am certainly in terms of the last reel of The Cook, Thief's Wife and Her Lover, and certainly in The Baby of Macon, which is very much deliberately organized on a, a typical Verdi grand opera, which has three acts, two intervals, a prologue and a, co and a coda, and is organized very much in real time, and is also associated with those big characteristics of grand opera, which associated with the notions of costume drama. All that is part and parcel of the baby of Macon, but in terms of my opera work, I have, I wouldn't say, had a huge number of offers to be able to participate in conventional opera, but I've always rejected those invitations which suggested that I might have something to add to Madame Butterfly. I have absolutely nothing whatsoever to add to Madame Butterfly. So if I want to, or wish to, or get the opportunity to make opera in conventional opera house situations, it has to be essentially a brand new work working with uh, a very contemporary composer. And of course, the notions of opera that we have at the end of the 20th century are certainly somewhat different than notions of opera at the end of the 19th century. Okay, let's move on to the next clip, which is from The Tempest. <laughs> 
Where did the list of names come from? I think the same categories before. All the people that I'd ever known, uh, all sorts of references that I wanted to make, recapitulations of previous movies. Did I see Simon Rodia? You might very well have done, yes. It just struck, struck me <laughs> as I tried to scan them. Um, and Skillgood, um, I mean, how did that come about? Well, working on um, a TV Dante, we had um, worked with Gilgood playing the part of Virgil. Um, because it took so long to make, there were many, many opportunities for conversations with uh, Gilgood about all manner of different things. And it very, very soon came up that he was interested in making the possibilities, or considering the possibilities, of making what he thought, since he was quite convinced that Shakespeare wrote Prospero just for him, <laughs> of the possibilities of making a film version of The Tempest. Um, his great rival, Lance Olivier, had already made three, or maybe should we say two and a half performances on film that would last. Uh, Hamlet, Richard III, I would say the half was Othello. And um, since their lives had run in tandem for so long, he had a feeling that he wanted to um, put down some sort of performance to be remembered by. I think he'd, he'd discussed this proposition with a lot of people all around the world. Um, Kifslowski, I think, had uh, discussed it. He'd even discussed it with Bergman. I know for a time also Derek Jarman, and he had discussed the proposition for all sorts of reasons, some of them very, very practical, some to do with temperament, it never ever happened. I discussed the proposition with my Dutch composer, Case Cassander, to see if uh, it would be a valid proposition. And just to test the water, I wrote, I think, um, a scenario of about the first, uh, I don't know, the first act, I think, of The Tempest, discussed it with uh, Gilgood, and he seemed to be very intrigued by it. He's played the part, I think, at least um, 15 or 16 times. I think he played it first when he was very, very young, when he was about 23 or 24. And did he play it in the way in which he wanted it to be played, or what was the relationship between you? I think it would be very, very difficult <laughs> to try and persuade such a gentleman as Sir John Gilgood to go against the grain of what he thought would be appropriate. <laughs> and what, did, did he talk to you about what underlay his interpretation of the part? We did discuss what he felt about the Magic Island, what his relationships should be towards Miranda, ideas of uh, forgiveness and recapitulation and all the grand themes that are present very much in The Tempest. Uh, he was particularly struck, of course, and this is something we capitalized on, that maybe The Tempest is the only play that seems apparently to have a direct autobiographical gesture at the very end when the character of Prospero turns to the audience and makes a farewell, not only in terms of his position in that play, but also a generalized farewell to the notions of theater anyway. So we developed the idea of this sort of triumvirate. So we would concern ourselves with a strategy whereby Shakespeare, Gilgood, and Prospero should all be the same man. So Shakespeare's saying goodbye to the theater because this is, I think, by common consent, Shakespeare's last play. Gilgood is saying goodbye to the theater. And of course, Prospero is saying goodbye to the theater, as he understands it, in his position as being uh, a royal figure, uh, um, deregulating, as it were, uh, forcing a permanent exile in his position as being uh, the Duke of Milan. So this particular strategy is really the way in which uh, controls the whole scenario for this particular, this particular version of the play. And we were at pains, of course, not to call it The Tempest, but to call it, in fact, Prospero's Books. Because to certain English purists, we did something absolutely unforgivable. We introduced new material. Um, as an account of that, a lot of English critics said in this particular version of The Tempest, there was far too much Greenaway and not enough Shakespeare. And how did you set about, uh, you know, think, thinking about the books? 1611 is supposed to be the second performance of The Tempest. I think 1603 is supposedly the time it was written. 
There is a suggestion that we are in, uh, certainly in English terms, into the sort of end of the general Renaissance influence, into the beginnings of mannerism. And there is a way that the notion of the academic studio is becoming very, very important. The idea of the Wunderkammer and the idea of the beginnings of the first European museums, so that the figure of Prospero is a great collator and organizer of information. So almost certainly back in Milan, he would have a library. And I think we legitimize our strategy because there are just two or three lines in the original Shakespearean text which suggest that Gonzalo, his great friend, did dump in the bottom of the boat that brought them into exile a series of books. There are various mentions throughout the Tempest of Prospero's books and the famous lines at the end about drowning his books. So we tended to um, exaggerate or elaborate that and to speculate what those books would be. So we invented uh, 24 books, which ultimately contained, from the position of Prospero, all the world's knowledge on the one hand, but also it's um, calculable from the text to know that uh, Miranda and Prospero spent 15 years on the island, and he had to colonize it, he had to educate his daughter, he had to create a magic paradise for all the circumstances that were to happen afterwards. So we invented a library of 24 books, which would not only re respond to all the knowledge of that particular time in the early 17th century, but would also provide Prospero with the wherewithal to create the magic on the island. So we virtually ran our list down all the different types of genre. There was, um, uh, there was a floral, there was a pornography, there was a book of mathematics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, I mean, I've, again, I seem to remember reading somewhere you talking about the cook in terms of Jacobean revenge drama and John Ford and mm. all that. Um, and this one looks to me like a, a mask, and that was conscious, I presume. Yes. How did you think about that? Well, again, the evidence that when the play was revived in 1611, for the marriage of James I's daughter, that um, this was really the beginning of the elaborate court mask as practiced by Inigo Jones and Ben Jonson at this particular time. And the whole of The Tempest is seen as one elaborate um, symbolic supporting the notion of divine right of kings, the ideas of uh, James I's um, notion of where he was posited in a system of masks which were deeply symbolic and full of processions and etiquette and demonstrations of how the hierarchy of England, as seen by the Jacobeans, should be organized. And so if you read the play under those sorts of circumstances, it can in see, indeed be seen like one extraordinarily uh, symbolic organization between the gods and men, which can be associated very much with ideas of dance, uh, idealized movement, etiquette, and ritual. And I think uh, it's certainly our uh, wish to promote and emphasize those particular characteristics in this film. I mean, how much time do you actually spend on res research before you start writing a, a, a screenplay? Well, I'm sure you would agree with me that um, maybe research under certain circumstances is the last thing one should ever do, yeah. on the grounds that research entirely kills imagination. So I think the general premise that I would, uh, would go, would perform on, would be basically to write the script without any research, so-called, certainly not any particular poring over books in the British Museum. And then if we felt it absolutely necessary afterwards, and then maybe check one or two of our facts. <laughs> um, and I suppose that that particular process has been <laughs> responsible for all the films. Um, I suppose I, I have a great curiosity and interest. I have a, uh, an avid ability to hold and retain information. And um, there is a way in which I certainly would like to use that, despite the fact that Pauline Kyle once suggested that I was a cultural omnivore who ate with his mouth open. <laughs> that I'm very, very keen that that sort of um, information, researched or non-research, should make the fabric and the layering of these films. I mean, how many books do you own? Oh, I suppose about 80 or 90,000. I thought as much. <laughs> um, there's a kind of line running through from TV Dante through um, Prospero's books to the pillow book. 
I mean, how would you describe the differences, you know, as you, you go along that line? A curiously a sense of disenchantment about cinema, how it continually seemed to be unable to deal with so many excitements for the late 20th century mind, all the other things that were already happening in a very exciting way in terms of painting, gallery installation. I suppose the two big phenomena, which often sound uh, incredibly fashionable and you can be very dismissive about them, but notions of interactivity and multimedia, which the cinema cannot handle. That, on the one hand, continually wanted me to take more and more risks in terms of utilizing a filmic vocabulary and also embracing all the new technologies, but also turned me in some senses away from maybe the limitations of what cinema seemed to be capable of, certainly within the confines of what I always describe as the Casablanca syndrome cinema. And that would have led me to an examination of, uh, again, as we've intimated already, all sorts of activity outside of cinema in terms of making exhibitions and so on. My disenchantment still continues as of the moment because I don't really think we've seen anything really exciting and radical in cinema for maybe 25 years or so now. I think the great, um, the last experimenters, the last people to actually wish to widen out the potentiality of cinema vocabulary, you'd have to go to maybe the Germans in the 1970s, people like Fassbinder, uh, maybe early vendors, those sort of people indeed. Um, certainly my favorite still, again, deeply unfashionable, is Herzog. Mm -hmm. And um, there is a way in which I think ever since then, there has not really been any great new visual vocabulary in cinema. But I, I, despite this current pessimism, I am indeed extremely optimistic about what's going to happen next. I think the notion of 100 years is probably just about right. Most aesthetic technologies last about 100 years before they are overhauled and revitalized by the possibility of new ideas, new thoughts, and indeed, as is so very, very apparent in the whole history of the manufacture of imagery, it's the technology of making those images which are so essential for new revolutions. And then it's leading into the pillow book. Actually, I wanted to say one thing. I mean, what about Siebelberg? Yes. Um, I, you know that's phenomenon that there never is or never can be somehow one film that doesn't offer you one nanosecond of excitement. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't mean to say you've got to look at an awful lot of nanoseconds to somehow really create yeah. a total yeah. excitement about the phenomenon of cinema. Um, my inspiration certainly for the last uh, maybe eight or ten years has certainly come from extra uh, cinema activities. Such a lot of energy and excitement I think currently in terms of British art. Always certainly I've been deeply fascinated by what still photography and painting and literature is always doing and experimenting with. Because there is a way that cinema is deeply, deeply conservative medium. We could say and excuse it and justify it by saying it apparently has to be so expensive. And certainly in some cases it's a huge compromise art because it involves so many collaborators. I'm never quite sure that those two particular characteristics really excuses the fact that the movements and the attitudes and the perspectives in cinema have not been so exciting, for example, as in terms of other art forms between 1895 and 1995. Look what has happened in literature. Look what's happened in music, look what's happened in painting in exactly the same period of time. No, I agree with you. <coughs> uh, so one of the reference in the interview with you said that uh, Deep is supposed to be the first of a trilogy on uh, similar themes. Is that still planned? Um, yes, indeed. The idea was to make, uh, it wasn't, I suppose, uh, essentially, it only occurred after we were, I suppose, halfway through making the second part of the three parts of this trilogy. So the first part was Prosperous Books, Uses and Abuses of Magic. Second, The Baby of Macon, Uses and Abuses of uh, Religion and Superstition. And the third one was going to be called Algbergen's Fault. Don't worry too much about that title. You all remember Koyanaskatsi, which once upon a time was unpronounceable, but now we can all pronounce it. <laughs> the third one was called Algbergen's Fault, and it was about the uses and abuses of war, sense of la gloire. There was a way in which it became extremely difficult to make this third part. 
The baby of Macron was absolutely smashed very, very severely in London and certainly in certain parts of Europe, was dragged screaming and kicking out of the cinemas. Everybody detested the movie from the extreme right-wing press to the extreme liberal press. So it was always going to be very, very difficult to find the money to pursue those sorts of ideas. The third film, indeed, was going to be, again, another exposition of my interest in the sense of the Baroque 17th century, making all sorts of analogies about suspension of disbelief in Roman Catholicism and the suspension of disbelief in the cinema. And the story was basically about an anatomist in 1610 when certainly the Thirty Years' War was still uh, devastating Europe, maneuvering all the way, I suppose, from Scandinavia right across to Turkey when the whole of Europe was covered in dead corpses. Not just corpses of soldiers, because everybody was embroiled, male, female, young, old, Africans, uh, members of all sorts of different armies were continually maneuvering backwards and forwards across Europe. And the story was about this young anatomist who in 1610 still believed in the possibility that the human soul was a part of the physical body, maybe part of the cortex of the brain, or like a spleen, or the liver. And his fond, if somewhat naive, hope was that if he could locate the soul, he could possibly organize an operation in order to eradicate evil. So you can see, full of metaphors as well as the literal concerns. But because all our movies are made for very, very small sums of money, it would be absolutely impossible to spend huge sums of money on making all these excellent dead bodies. <laughs> I also would like the notion of making a film almost entirely in the dark, but you could see if I did make it in the dark, maybe I could get away with a lot of things which full light of day would not allow me. <laughs> I sincerely believe that it's the old men that basically, certainly in Western culture, have created the circumstances of war and sent the young men off to fight it. We also have in England a whole uh, coterie of very, very good and elderly actors, Alec Guinness and Gilgood being but just two. And I've always wanted to be able to find a way of utilizing all these extraordinary old talents who are very, very rarely used now. So you can see the circumstances and the characteristics of the film. All the actors would be over 65. The entire film happens in the dark and the subject is necrophilia. So after the lack of critical and box office success of The Baby of Macon, extremely difficult to raise the money. <laughs> but we certainly hope to make the film someday. Um, I'm particularly interested in your creative process. And obviously there's a tremendous amount of research on the craft on the story in uh, layers of, of, of material that you put in the film. But I'm very curious about uh, the process, uh, your process of, of developing an idea and, uh, and turning it into a script. Well, well I, I would like to think that I am interested in the notion of a cinema of ideas, and the ideas are always the prime reason for going on the, each journey of each film. If I could take some examples, The Belly of an Architect, there was a time, I think, in the mid-1980s when the English became obsessed with the notion of the responsibility of architects and architecture, an argument that, it is said, was most alive the last time after the Great Fire of London when everybody wanted to have some say in how London should be rebuilt. And you probably know that into this debate in the 1980s entered Prince Charles with all sorts of unfortunate uh, reactionary, very, very stupid comments. So I, I wanted to, as a private individual, to engage in this debate, to talk about the responsibilities of architecture, etc. So that, that was the general premise. But I'm not a polemicist. I don't want to be a documentary filmmaker. I want to discuss these ideas in an entertaining and narrative form. Although latterly, again, I have great suspicions about use of narrative in the cinema. And therefore, it was essential to find a character, to find a plot, to find a circumstance, and to find a location. I suspect, since I'm interested in classical architecture, and there's a concern, I suppose, with the horizontal and the vertical, and notions of symmetry, which are all part of the vocabulary, that having got the idea, let's talk about architecture. The next thing is, let's talk about classical architecture. Where's the best place to find that? Let's go to Rome. <laughs> 
Then I suppose an examination of Roman architecture, dividing it up according to the plan of the seven hills of Rome, seven architectural periods. You can see how the notions of structuring begins to happen. From a completely different source, I was fascinated by the painting by Bronzino of Andrea Doria. Uh, there is a way in which I ought to be honest too about certain autobiographical incidents. When I went to Rome to publicize the draftsman's contract, I was struck down by a most appalling stomachache. I think since that stomachache vanished the very moment that I went to Da Vinci Airport and caught a plane home, it must have been psychosomatic in the case of nerves. But I was fascinated about the idea of a man having a stomachache in Rome. <laughs> so you can see again how these ideas are accumulating. So I had a lot of material to play with and gradually uh, I identified also with the fact, another autobiographical detail, that my very large fat father, who had an enormous belly, died of stomach cancer. So here we again have all sorts of personal autobiographical, general theoretical ideas, which gradually wove themselves into a film. Um, when I felt ready and had, I suppose, considered at least in jottings on a few sheets of paper where I was at, then it was necessary to discuss the proposition with the producer. And if there was encouragement and indeed development money, then I would sit down maybe for two months and write the script. And I think that that general processing, of course with variations, has been the way in which all the films have been engendered. Well, uh, whenever I step out of the room uh, with films that you make, I feel like a little bit challenged or like a, almost close to an idiot. Um, you know, the script contains a lot of information and images move fast. Images, um, and each frame has such a um, manicured and composed um, decoration and stage. And uh, I mean, even one director would spend like 20 minutes with one frame that you would just, you just, you just let it fly. <laughs> Is there any message behind that manifestation? Well, I, I certainly think that if one's going to invest a lot of uh, patience and money and intelligence into a product which should be extremely, as I would see it, well wrought, well made, well constructed, I would necessarily also feel that this product should be seen many, many times. So I would like to invest my energies in a highly repeatably viewable cinema. Cecil B. DeMille once said, if you didn't understand everything in a film in one go, the film was a failure. Well, rubbish, absolute rubbish. It's perfectly reasonable and absolutely necessary to read poetry many, many times. It's viable and necessary to read a novel many times to get all its nuances. And if you begin to consider what is necessary in order to understand music, then it is absolutely essential again to develop your own sensitivities towards it, to in some senses to come halfway to uh, develop a full understanding of the artifact. I'm sure that it's all our experiences that the works of art that have really had a big effect on us, we in a sense have made a halfway journey towards it. We have worked at it and it has continued to reward us continuously afterwards. I would like to imagine that we could use cinema under the same sorts of circumstances. It would be extremely facetious of me to suggest, of course, if you go and see the film many, many times, that must also be good for the box office. That is not my intention. I would certainly like to respond and to make films in the way that I myself have enjoyed other people's films. And I think in terms also of the way in which television and all the other post-television arts are now encouraging a diversity of information a great potential for discussing metaphor and literal meaning. There is a way in which the post-television arts in some senses are educating us into new ways of looking at visual information. So I would make no apology for the density of information. I would certainly make no apology for the way in which they are structured. I would just ask uh, your sympathy, the sympathy of audiences, to regard this as the proposition of an artifact which should very reasonably be viewed many, many times. Yeah, and from that, I'm going to say one more question. 
Well, that's a little game, I've got a bit of power here. <laughs> <laughs> the one who's furthest back is, is not. Yeah, you, yeah, you. Oh, are. very nice. Uh, well, uh, sort of philosophical question. Uh, you could give me a minute. Um, how would you discuss the relationship between what we've been calling your literary imagination and all this image, uh, the images that you clearly have in layered images? Is there some way to connect those two things? Well, I suppose this this last good question really does give me a space for my favorite platform. <laughs> I do not think we have seen any cinema yet. I think we've seen a hundred year, year prologue. We have seen a hundred years of illustrated text. So whether your name is Scorsese or Spielberg or Godard or Wenders, you have to have a text first before you can have an image. We have just seen the travesty of the English patient. What a waste of time, money, and effort that was. Why do we spend, why do we feel so culturally insecure about cinema that we constantly have to go to the bookshop for our inspiration? Why can't we make true cinema cinema which operates completely from ground zero? And I suppose the pillar book is for me yet another example or possibility to try and find new ways of making a reinvention of cinema. The proposition behind the pillar book is this notion of the Japanese or Oriental hieroglyph, which is both an image and a text at one and the self same time. The history of Japanese painting is almost entirely analogous to the history of Japanese literature. And certainly in the West, we have this sort of fortress separation by the notion that painting is here and literature is here. And surely the cinema would be the ideal place in which to bring those two things together. So this is the second film I've made, very deliberately, which has the word book in its title. Prospero's books are now the pillar book, if only to draw intense attention to what is happening in terms of what we think cinema is all about. And of course, this film is redolent of the uses of text and image, and the connections, and the proposition about the activities of the primacy of the text versus the primacy of the image. So it is an essay about the misalignment, if you like, about the conditions, in some senses, of the cinema we've arrived at after 100 years. Thank you.